Well, good evening. As it's been said tonight, we're going to talk about one of the greatest tasks known to man, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. A few weeks ago on a Sunday, I was sitting comfortably on my couch when my doorbell rang. And normally when our doorbell rings, it's one of the neighbor girls asking if one of our girls could play. And one of my girls will run to the door at Mach 10. So I had little intention of getting up and answering it. Um, but the girls answered the door and, and they said, Dad, there's a man at our door. And they always say it so ominously like that. Uh, so I did, I got up and I answered the door and I met a salesman and he was working for a home remodeling company and wanted to know if I wanted to schedule a home remodeling project. He was wearing a hat, he was a middle-aged man, um, just a, a nice guy, but he seemed a little indifferent as to whether or not I would schedule a home remodeling project with his company. He said something like, uh, do you have any home remodeling projects coming up or are you good? And <laughs> I did not have any home remodeling projects coming up and I felt the pull back to the couch but then I realized God had sent this man to my door. Sure, he was, our house was next on his map, his, his route that his boss had charted for him. But I knew ultimately that the all-knowing sovereign God had sent this man to my door and I had a responsibility to say more than just no thank you. So that's because he's an eternal soul. He's going somewhere, either heaven or hell. I needed to find out. I needed to warn him. So I said, no, thank you, but could I ask you a question? It's a spiritual question. And he said, sure. I asked, if you were to die today, where would you go? And he looked at me and he said, I don't know. And it wasn't a, I don't know and I don't care. It was a, I don't know and I truly wish I did. So I said, well, can I share with you what the Bible says about how to know for sure where you'll spend eternity? And he said, yeah. And so I talked about sin. I talked about its definition, its penalty. I told him about Jesus Christ, how God sent his son Jesus Christ to the earth to die on a cross and to rise again as, as payment for our sins. The only way to be forgiven of your sins and have eternal life is by believing in Jesus Christ, putting your faith in him and no one else. We had a good conversation. We talked more about these things. I shared I gave him a tract, I invited him, uh, I, I recommended a church in Omaha to him since that's where he was from and asked him if we could pray on my porch. And the gospel seed was planted. This man didn't pray to accept Christ at that moment, but like so many testimonies in our church today, my hope and my prayer is for that man to hear the gospel again and again, possibly at the church he attends and one day be convicted of his sins and have his life changed. My prayer is that God would grant him repentance leading to salvation. As Pastor Jesse read earlier, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God, uh, the uh, surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are like earthen vessels, clay pots, breakable, replaceable, used for, for holding waste and garbage, but we possess the greatest treasure on the earth, the, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. So tonight, we're gonna discuss our responsibility as a faithful church to scatter, to go beyond our own assembly and spread the gospel to the lost. Tonight, we're going to look at what the Bible says about our motive, about our barriers, our message, and our reward. By God's grace, we'll become better equipped and more faithful in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. So first, let's talk about our motive. Why should we share the gospel? Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 11. And in this passage, the apostle Paul is demonstrating how believers, Jews and Greeks, are saved by God. Romans 10, 11 through 15 says this, for the scripture says, whoever believes upon him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? <laughs> 
How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. In verse 14, Paul asks a series of rhetorical questions to outline the process of salvation. He gives six steps in reverse order. The process actually starts at the end of verse 15. First, they are sent, a preacher preaches, the sinner hears, the sinner believes, the sinner calls on the name of the Lord, and the sinner is saved. You'll notice that in four of these steps, God works directly in and through the sinner, the one being saved. God causes that sinner to hear, God causes the sinner to believe, God causes the sinner to call out, and God provides the sinner's salvation. But there's another party involved in the sequence. Two out of six of the steps involve the preacher. That's you and me. God sends the preacher and the preacher preaches. As sinners who have been saved by God, you and I are now critical components in God's process of salvation going forward. We're like conveyor belts who bring people to God. The Greek word for preach in verse 14 means to herald, to announce. It's not limited to proclamations from a pastor or a teacher. Everyone, both pastors in the pulpit and believers in the pews, are called to preach God's message. We're called to be heralds, proclaimers of the gospel to the lost. In the first century, a herald was vested with authority. He conveyed the official messages of kings, of magistrates, princes, military commanders. If the herald misrepresented his message, or if he neglected his responsibility, he could, pay, he could face legal consequences or even death. You know, the omnipotent God could have implanted the gospel in people's minds. He could cause people to wake up one day and say, I've decided to follow Jesus. But he did not choose to do it that way. He doesn't communicate to gos- the gospel to sinners telepathically. In fact, in the Bible, the only time God saved someone through a vision was when he saved the Apostle Paul. And even Paul knew the message of the way before Christ appeared to him on the Damascus Road because that was the very message that he was trying to suppress and extinguish. And he was trying to extinguish the followers of the way. Throughout scripture, we see that God's means of saving sinners is through the preaching of the good news. It's by word of mouth or through humans writing to humans. God saves sinners through sinners. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, after listening to the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Revelation 3.3, Jesus tells the church in Sardis, So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. And of course, the book of Acts is just this enormous record of preachers preaching, uh, the people hearing, the people believing, the people calling out in faith, and the people being saved. For example, in Acts 13, 48, after Paul and Barnabas spent two Sabbaths speaking the word of the Lord, it says, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Praise God. Praise God, he uses people like you and me, breakable and replaceable clay pots to carry the life-changing message message of salvation. We are instruments in his hands, tools for his use, messengers carrying his message. 2 Corinthians 5.20, a great verse to memorize for evangelism says, so then we are ambassadors for Christ. As God is pleading through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Therefore, one of our motives for spreading the gospel, and we can call this subpoint number one, is because evangelism is God's means of salvation for sinners today. Here's subpoint two. A second motive for sharing the gospel with the lost is that evangelism is a command. Evangelism is a command. Turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, and we'll start in verse 18. After Jesus rose from the dead, 
He appeared to many and gave them proof that he experienced a bodily resurrection. Acts 1 tells us that he taught his disciples, his apostles, for 40 days about the kingdom of God. But before he ascended into heaven, he said this to his apostles, Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We call this the Great Commission. The single imperative or command in the Great Commission can be found in the phrase, make disciples of all the nations. The disciples were to do what Jesus did, make more disciples, make more learners or followers of Jesus Christ. And this was an important moment because about three years earlier in Matthew 4, 19, when Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew casting their nets into the sea. He approached them and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Then for the next three years, Jesus walked with them, talked with them, ate with them, prayed with them, revealed things to them, and taught them how to make disciples. Now here in Matthew 28, at the end of his ministry, Jesus was about to leave the disciples' side and ascend into heaven out of their sight. The training wheels were coming off and he was preparing them to be on their own. This command to make disciples is supported by three participles, going, baptizing, and teaching. They modify the command. These are the means of disciple making. In other words, disciple making happens as Christians go, baptize, and teach. The book of Acts records how disciples faithfully carried out their instructions. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts 2:38. 2, Pentecost was roughly 10 days after Jesus' ascension, and Peter didn't waste any time with his instructions. He took them seriously. Here's what he said to the crowd at Pentecost in Acts 2, 38. And Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself and with many other words, he solemnly bore witness and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this crooked generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. As you can see, people like Peter took Jesus' great commission seriously. He took it to heart. He baptized, they, they taught, they made more disciples. They were faithful to it from the beginning and God demonstrated his power. About 3,000 souls were saved in just one day. Now I realize it's a bit controversial to say that it is a command to evangelize. Some argue that the Great Commission was only given to the 11 disciples, they're also called apostles, and therefore it does not apply to us today. And while it is true that contextually the Great Commission was given to the apostles, it was not only for the apostles. The command teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you certainly includes the, the command to make disciples. D.A. Carson notes that the Great Commission does not record Jesus saying, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you except for the command to make disciples. Keep their grubby hands off that one since it only belongs to you, my dear disciples. Furthermore, in the church's infant stage in the book of Acts, we see non-apostles taking on the Great Commission. They understood that the commission was for them. Stephen, Philip, Barnabas, Apollos, Cornelius, Priscilla, Aquila, Lydia, they were not apostles. They did not receive the commission directly from our Lord, but they did actively share and obey the command to make disciples. This command to make disciples began with Christ's example. He commissioned it to his apostles. He passed the command on down to every new disciple, down to us today. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? I am. We are commanded to make disciples. 
So we've seen that our motive for scattering is number one, because evangelism is God's means of salvation. Number two, evangelism is a command. And for our third subpoint, we'll see that evangelism is an act of love. It's an act of love. The Apostle Paul was a man who had little regard for his own comforts when it came to following Christ and loving unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 11.26, he put it mildly when he said he encountered dangers from his countrymen. His countrymen, the Jews, were his worst persecutors. Their leaders saw him as a heretic for proclaiming the gospel. They accused him of blasphemy and sought to silence him. In Acts 9.23, not too long after his conversion to Christ, the Jews in Damascus plotted to kill him. He had escaped the city by being lowered in a basket through an opening in the wall. In Acts 14.5, the Jews and Gentiles plotted to mistreat and stone Paul. And in Acts 14.19, the Jews finally got it done. They stoned Paul outside of Lystra and left him for dead. All of this happened prior to when Paul wrote Romans chapter nine. Let's take a look at it. Look at Romans chapter nine with me. The Jews Paul was writing about in this chapter were boasting because they falsely trusted in their Jewish heritage. They thought they were saved merely because they were Israel's descendants. In reality, they rejected their Messiah and were his enemies. But in Romans 9, 1 through 3, Paul reveals his heart toward his persecutors. He says, I am not lying, or I'm telling the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul desperately wanted to see his countrymen saved. Sorrow here means sadness or heaviness, like the feeling of carrying a constant weight on your shoulders. The King James Version translates this phrase, great heaviness and continual sorrow. In a way, Paul wishes that he were accursed or that he could trade places with the Jews. Accursed comes from the Greek word anathema, which means consigned to damnation or destruction. Paul was saying, I wish I could trade places with you so that I might be damned and you might have eternal life. Paul knew, of course, this was not possible because of the promises he had in Christ, but it does show and express his heart, his desire for his fellow countrymen to be saved. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, but he always had the Jews on his heart. Look at the next chapter in Romans chapter 10, verse one. He says, brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation, referring to the Jews. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not, in according, but not according to knowledge. And that word prayer conveys the idea of persistent pleading with God. This was not a quick prayer at mealtimes. Paul earnestly and fervently pled with God for their salvation. How do you pray for the lost? Is your heart's desire to see your unbelieving friend, coworker, neighbor, that family member, that, that brother or, or parent who doesn't know the Lord, is, your, is it your heart's desire to see them saved, to see them believe in Jesus Christ and forsake their sin and, and have, their, have heaven be their destiny? And if that's the case, do you pray for them? Do you speak up when you have the opportunity I like what John MacArthur says in his commentary on Romans, a theology that does not reflect genuine, heartfelt compassion for the lost and a deep desire for their salvation is a theology that's unbiblical. Sharing the gospel is one of the most loving things that you and I can do for someone on earth. It's one of the most loving things we can do. Give them the gospel, give them the truth. We are commanded to share and compelled to share. If everyone is a sinner and if the wages of sin is death, then that means everyone is on their way to eternal hell. Unless they know Christ, they're heading towards a place of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, a place of, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you thought about that deeply? Deeply. 
Next time you're at a, in a big crowd at a, a football game or a restaurant or the mall, remember that Jesus Christ says the way is broad and wide that leads to destruction and many enter through it. And then remember that you and I have the way that leads to life. You have the life preserver. You simply have to toss it out and pray they grab hold. We don't want anyone to go to hell. And Jesus says no one has to. Romans 10, 13 says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. May we grow in our love for the lost, knowing that we too were once lost ourselves. May we give them the only key that can set them free, the hope of eternal life. So we've looked at our motive for scattering. We've seen that evangelism is the primary means, God's means of salvation. Evangelism is a, is, a, is a command and evangelism is an act of love. Now let's turn to our second major point, our barriers. What are our barriers for sharing Christ? What obstacles stand in our way? What hurdles must we leap over in order to be effective witnesses? And quite simply, there are two barriers. Uh, we are ineffective for Christ when, number one, we possess a fear of man, and number two, when we lack a fear of God. Those are the two barriers, possessing a fear of man and lacking a fear of God. To fear man means to be excessively concerned or anxious about what others think of us. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. We're gonna turn here because Jesus, our, our sympathetic priest, was aware of this temptation. He knew that his followers would want to run at the first sight of danger. This is, reminds me of the way a cockroach scatters in the light or the way sheep flee at the sight of any predator. I was reading once that uh, if a bunny jumps out of a bush, it can cause a stampede of, of, for the sheep. God knows us well when he calls us sheep. In Matthew 10, 24, when he sent out his disciples, Jesus warned them as to what they should expect. Matthew 10, 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. If they called Christ Beelzebul, the name of a Philistine God, ruler of demons, how will they treat you? In John 15, 20, Jesus says, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Were the disciples to cower in fear, run to the caves, quit their ministries and give up? No. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. And history is replete of those who have been successful at killing the body. Um, even in Acts, Acts 6, Stephen boldly preached and proclaimed miracles in the name of Christ. Drawing the ire of the Jewish leaders, they eventually dragged him out of the city, picked up heavy rocks, and stoned him to death. In 155 AD, Polycarp, who tradition says was the pastor at the church of Smyrna, would, re would not revile Christ. He said, for 80 and six years, I have been his servant and he has done me no wrong. And how can I now blaspheme my king who saved me? He was stripped naked, bound to the stake and burned alive. When his executioners saw that the, the fire was not successful, they were ordered to go up and stab him with a dagger. In 1956, just 68 years ago, Jim Elliott felt called to reach the Wahurani Indians in Ecuador known uh, with the gospel, and they were known for their, their violent hostility towards outsiders. Elliot and his four companions were speared to death in attempt to deliver the gospel to that tribe. 
Millions more Christians have been burned, hung, executed in brutal ways for the sake of Christ. But violent men throughout history have never been able to touch the soul. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. And you know, by God's grace in this country at this time, you and I likely don't have to fear death for sharing the gospel. Um, the most prevalent threat to Christians today is, is probably psychological. We battle a psychological fear of man. We have grown accustomed to obsessing what people think of us. We constantly seek affirmation on social media, in our workplaces, in our friend groups, in our communities, because we fear being rejected. Standing up for Christ and sharing the gospel may cost us our social status. It may cost us friends. It may cost us privileges like being liked and respected by people we work with. It may even cost us a good relationship with some family members. You know that feeling when you meet somebody for the first time and, and everything's going well and you're, you're having a good conversation, you feel like you have a lot in common, and so you decide to share the gospel with them, they don't believe, and all of a sudden, the relationship changes. The vibe changes. They're no longer as friendly to you. They're kind of watching what they say. They might start to swear and then say, oops, sorry. All of a sudden, you notice you're not being invited to things. You're, you're not invited to the neighborhood barbecues or weekend social gatherings. But you know, if we're told not to fear those who can harm the body, then should we fear those who can harm the emotions? Should we fear those who can harm our self-esteem? This is called an a fortiori argument. That Latin phrase means from the stronger. If the stronger statement, don't kill those, or don't fear those who kill the body, is true, then logically, the weaker statement, don't fear those who can harm the emotions, is also true. If we are not to fear great violence, then we are not to fear intimidation either. Besides, Jesus says there is a blessing for those who are insulted and persecuted in his name. Matthew 5, 11 through 12 says, blessed are, are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God's word offended people when the prophets gave it God's word often offends people when you and I give it. The gospel often divides. Now, it's important to note here that it should only be the gospel that divides. You and I can't blame any social isolation that we experience if we're being rude or if we're being insensitive or if we say something strange or off-putting. We need to remember Romans 12, 17 through 18, which says, never paying back evil for evil to anyone, respecting what is good in the sight of all men, and if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. We must recognize that possessing a fear of man is a hindrance, a real barrier to our gospel witness. Another barrier to, barrier to evangelism is when we lack a fear of God. And really, all barriers could fall under this category. Uh, to, to fear God means to revere him and obey him. I like the definition Pastor Jesse gave a few weeks ago. I've heard it mentioned by others as well uh, for fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord is a conscious submission of every aspect of one's life to God's ways, God's will, and God's word. It's a conscious submission. A believer fears God and they fear him to the point where they obey him. Hugh Latimer, a Protestant reformer, was preaching one day in the presence of King Henry VIII. He said to himself, Latimer, Latimer, remember that the king is here. Be careful what you say. And then he realized what he was saying and said to himself again, Latimer, Latimer, remember that the king of kings is here. Remember to be careful about what you do not say. This kind of healthy fear was a motivation for the early church. 
in Acts 9.31, it says that the church was going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it continued to increase. Acts 19.17, it says that fear fell upon them all at Ephesus, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. When we choose our comfort over God's will, we lack the fear of God. When we are selfish with our time, we lack the fear of God. When we are convicted to share Christ with someone and we suppress and ignore that conviction, we lack the fear of God. Have you seen these barriers pop up in your life? How many times have we kept our mouth shut because we had too many things to do that day? How many times have we kept the truth in because it would simply take too much effort to get the truth out? We need to fear God. We need to remember that God knows everything we think, God hears everything we say, and God sees everything we do. Hebrews 4.13 says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Christians must dig deep into God's word to understand who he is and why his commands should be obeyed. We must not possess a fear of man nor lack of fear of God. Oftentimes, Christians do fear God a little, but it's not enough to compel them to learn the message well. Not knowing the message well can certainly be a barrier, but thankfully, it's an easy barrier to clear. It just takes time and effort. In this section titled, Our Message, I'll cover how to share the gospel as well as some practical methods for introducing the gospel, presenting it, and closing the conversation. Now, once you've decided to share the gospel with someone, it's starting the conversation is not as hard as you think. You just think of a lead-in question or a probing question, and then you just go for it. From a cold evangelism standpoint, if, if I'm going door to door or uh, sharing the gospel outside of the union at UNL, I'll, I'll be upfront with people about what I'm doing. I'll just walk around and say, hey, we're walking around UNL campus asking people about their faith. Can I ask you a spiritual question? Or if you're in a different situation, maybe you're with a friend or somebody you know a bit better, uh, you might ask about their religious background or ask them if they attend a church. Um, if so, what do they teach? What do you believe about where you'll spend eternity? What do they believe about Jesus Christ? Sometimes we're not very smooth at all, are we? This past week, two ladies came to our house and they bought a dresser that we, we sold on Facebook Marketplace. And uh, they, they bought the dresser and paid us and are about to head to their car. And I said, hey, I got a question. Where are you going when you die? It, it wasn't very smooth at all, and they were believers, so it ended up being a friendly conversation, but it didn't start all that great. But I do like that question. Um, if you were to die, where would you go? Where would you be? Because it helps people formulate what they really believe. A lot of people, surprisingly, have not thought about what's going to happen to them when they die. So when you ask that question, you, you help them solidify their own beliefs, and you help them articulate what they actually believe. It's really amazing. So many people have thought about their careers, about their retirement, but they totally neglect what comes after their retirement. After they told you that they're going to heaven because they're a good person or because they were baptized at eight or they kept God's 10 commandments, or maybe they say they're not going to heaven and they're going to be annihilated when they die. Either way, it doesn't really matter how they answer. The next question could be, well, can I share with you what the Bible says about how to answer that question, about how to have eternal life? And this is a critical point in the conversation. If they say no, then you might follow up with, well, are you sure? It won't take very long. Um, if they still say no, offer to give them a tract or invite them to, to church or ask them to read the Bible and, and pray that God's word changes their mind. It's helpful for me to remember that I am not the one who saves them. I am not the one who convicts them of their sins. I can't even convince them about the, the veracity of Jesus Christ or life after death. I've, I'm simply called to be a faithful herald. And I'll even share that with them too. I, I can't convince you of anything, but all I know is that I'm accountable to share this 
this word, God's word, and one day you'll be accountable for it as well. So on the other hand, if they say, well, yes, go ahead and tell me what the Bible says, then you want to present the gospel. There's more than one way to effectively present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many acronyms or mnemonic devices have been suggested. There's ABC, which stands for admit, believe, confess. There's faith, forgiveness, available, impossible, turn, heaven. Or gospel, where each letter represents a biblical truth. The most important thing, whether you use an acronym or not, is to make sure that they have enough information to walk away from the conversation and become saved. They should know where they stand before the Lord. And to share the gospel, you need to have it memorized. Reading off a tract or a pamphlet does not uh, instill confidence in, in you or the message. Just, if you're a believer, tell them what you came to know when you accepted Christ as Savior. If you're a believer, you know the gospel. But having an acronym does help because it helps us present it in a logical way. So I'd like to introduce an acronym or remind you of an acronym that we've talked about before, one that this church has taught for a couple of years now. It's printed on our, <clears throat> on our evangelism material. The acronym is GMCS, GMCS. And thanks to Jack McGovern, I can't shake the image of a red GMC truck that he printed on t-shirts and gave away to everybody. So if that helps you, great. Uh, GMCS stands for God, Man, Christ, Sinners. God, Man, Christ, Sinners. Start with the first letter, G. I might say, the Bible talks about God. God created and owns everything. God is perfectly holy and requires perfect obedience. Now, can you define holiness? It's important to ask questions because this helps the listener be engaged and it helps you direct and guide the conversation as well. If they say, no, I, I can't define holiness, then help them out a little. Maybe say, well, could you, say you had to explain holiness to a five-year-old. And they say, okay, sacred. I say, that's right. Holiness means sacred, set apart. John, 1 John 1, 5 says that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God is perfectly holy. He cannot and will not tolerate sin in his presence. Then I'll move to the next letter, M. M is for man. The Bible says that man has sinned against God. That's Romans 3.23. And that man will pay the eternal penalty for his sin. Do you know what man's eternal penalty is? I guess I kind of gave it away in that answer. Do you know what man's penalty is according to the Bible? And it's important to keep the conversation about the Bible. We're not concerned with what the Quran says or what the Book of, Moment, Book, of, Book of Mormon says. We are concerned with what does the Bible say and they ought to be too. Well, the penalty for sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And that's not just physical death, that's spiritual death, eternal death in a place called hell. That's a terrible sentence, isn't it? The Bible also says that man cannot save himself through his good works. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So we've covered who God is. We've covered who man is. Now C is for Christ. Christ came to earth as both God and sinless man. He demonstrated God's love by, by dying on a cross and paying sin's penalty. But Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave and he is alive today. The last letter is S. S stands for sinners. Sinners must repent of all that dishonors God. Sinners must believe in Christ as Lord and Savior. If you confess your mouth, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. At the end of the conversation, I might ask something like, have you heard of this message before? Or, or what do you think about what the Bible says? And you know, presenting the gospel doesn't have to be a long conversation at all. My dad, Dave Nicholson, is the best evangelist I know. He shares the gospel with everyone. A few weeks ago, he was in the hospital recovering from a procedure. He was a little bit groggy, uncomfortable, probably should have been resting, but he used every opportunity to share Christ. The, the chef walks in with his food and dad asks him about his religious background, says, can I share with you the greatest verse or one of the greatest verses in all of the Bible, John 3, 16? And the chef says, sure, 
So dad shared John 3:16 and gave a brief gospel presentation. The chef listened, took a tract, and left the room. The conversation was probably five minutes, but it covered a full gospel presentation. Thanks for the good example, dad. After you've presented the gospel and when you need to close the conversation, encourage them to learn more on their own. That's why it's helpful to hand them a tract. Ask them to read it when they have some time to think. Um, I've heard somebody suggest, put it on your nightstand and before you go to bed, maybe take a look and consider the truths. Encourage them to, to read the Bible. Start in the book of John, a great place for, new, uh, for, for people to start. Invite them to church where they can learn more. Remember that few are saved on the spot after hearing the gospel for the first time. Many need to chew on it, to meditate on it over and over. Just think, how many times did you hear the gospel before you were saved? And remember, again, it's not our job to convict them of their sin. It's not our job to regenerate their hearts. We can't do that. That's the Holy Spirit's work. It is our job to be faithful heralds, faithful messengers proclaiming God's message. Now, when we close the conversation, there are two things we, we shouldn't forget. Number one, pray. We shouldn't expect God to use or bring any success to our efforts without prayer. Pray for the opportunities to share or, or pray that we take the opportunities God already gives us. Pray for wisdom during the conversation that we would speak clearly and accurately. And then pray for the hearts of those you shared with. Pray that they would be convicted of their sins and realize the, the destructive nature of their sins and their need to believe in Jesus Christ. Pray like the Apostle Paul who said, my heart's desire and prayer for them is for their salvation. And then number two, follow up. Get their phone number. Ask if you can text them a reminder or uh, an invitation to church or a text about, well, have you thought about what we talked about? Be available for them and seek every opportunity to win them to Christ. Before we move on to our final point in tonight's workshop, I want to point out that cold and warm evangelism are not the only ways to help the lost become saved and to promote disciple making. Some of us claim to have Moses syndrome in Exodus 4.10. If you don't know what that is, he said, please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in times past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. First, if you're nervous about sharing the gospel, you're in good company. Moses was slow in speech, Jonah ran, and Paul asked people to pray for his boldness. We need boldness too. And then if you're reluctant to evangelize, I'd first encourage you to evaluate your heart. Yes, God has gifted people in different ways. There are some who God has gifted through speaking gifts, some who's gifted through serving gifts. But let's make sure that our slowness of speech is not slowness of heart. Make sure that your slowness is not because you possess a fear of man or because you lack a fear of God. That being said, if you're gifted in serving, consider teaming up with someone who's gifted in speaking. Host a meal and invite unbelievers over to your house. Serve at church events like VBS and fall kickoff where the gospel is an emphasis at those, at those events. Share the gospel online through posts or, or emails or texts. Build into and support evangelists through various means. But above all, be intentional about disciple making and sharing the good news. My wife and I were sitting down with Mike and Debbie Jeffers uh, a few weeks ago, and they said that when they were newly married, uh, they, were, they became saved when Mike's mother set up an evangelism meeting with another couple. They all sat around a table with this Christian couple, and the couple played a tape of someone sharing the gospel, and they listened to the tape. That night, Mike and Debbie says, said, we need to act on this. So you never know how, how God will use his word when we're faithful in sharing it. As far as resources go, I've been tremendously encouraged by our evangelism team here at the Hills. They don't exist to take evangelism off of our plates. They don't exist so that the rest of us can stay in our holy huddle. No, they exist to train and, and build up every member of the body in day-to-day -day evangelism. Evangelism. 
So maybe you need some ideas. Whether you'd like to serve or speak the gospel, uh, they're ready to help you. They'll encourage you in practical day-to-day evangelism. And I love that phrase, day-to-day evangelism. Our day-to-day actions ought to reflect the teachings of Jesus Christ. Our primary responsibility as Christians is not necessarily door-to-door or street evangelism. It's day-to-day evangelism. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So let's look at our final point for this evening, our reward. What is the reward for sharing the gospel with the lost? Well, our reward for sharing the gospel is the same as our purpose. Our purpose and our reward is to joyfully see the salvation of souls. In heaven, God and his angels are ecstatic when someone is rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Turn to Luke chapter 15. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables in response to the complaints of the Pharisees. Jesus highlights what he came to do on earth, to seek and to save that which is lost. Read with me. Here's Luke 15, 1. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, what man among you, if he has 100 sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who need, uh, 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus wasn't saying that the 99 sheep were not important. He was saying that the truly lost sheep, that is the sheep who repented and is saved, for them there is much joy, immense joy in heaven. All of heaven rejoices both God and his angels, and we ought to have that same joy. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, Paul writes, for who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting? Is it not even you before our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. In many of Paul's letters, he expresses this gospel joy with words like this. Here's Philippians 1, three through five. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all because of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. God's children delight in seeing their father add to their family. God's children love it when their father adopts. It's exciting to see God transform lives and it's exciting to be a part of it. Have you seen this type of transformation happen? Watch someone Repent, do a 180, and grow. It's a fascinating miracle. I knew a guy who was always quiet and kept to himself during high school. He was interested in sports and work and very little else. But when God saved him, his life completely transformed. He grew to be kind, selfless, and enamored with the word of God. Eventually, he became a pastor of a church. It's an amazing thing to watch. May we never lose this joy when we see sinners repent. Another reward that Christians receive for sharing the gospel are crowns in heaven. This is true for every good deed we do. Several passages in the New Testament tell us that after death or after the rapture, we will be rewarded for our deeds at the Bema Seat judgment of Christ. Since all our unrighteous deeds have been paid for at the cross, this judgment is a time of examination and reward. The Bema Seat judgment or the judgment seat of Christ is discussed in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 and Romans 14, 10 through 12, and you can look those up later on your own time. But right now, I wanna direct our attention to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, 
I believe Pastor Jesse read some of this this morning as he talked about our future as the church. Here we see that believers will be judged for their deeds in the future and that ought to change the way we live today. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Therefore, we, have, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You know that time you obeyed your parents or that time you told the truth or fled immorality or prayed for your governor or delivered a meal to a grieving friend or when you shared the gospel with a coworker? That time you did things because you wanted to worship the Lord, not because you wanted attention from man. God was watching. God saw it. God recorded it. And the amazing thing is, is that scripture says you and I will be recompensed for it. We'll be paid back, rewarded for our labors. Turn to Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 6, 6 through 9, this is the motivation Paul gives to slaves. He tells them to do their work with integrity as to Christ. In Ephesians 6, 6 through 9, he writes, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the integrity of your heart, as to Christ, not by way of eye service, as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, serving with good will as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. And there's no partiality with him. God judges righteously. Jesus at the Bema seat judgment judges rightly. There are no mistakes. There's no discrepancies in eyewitness accounts Rewards are given by the righteous judge. I recently saw an article about a 52-year-old 50, man who uh, was extremely diligent in his life, worked 90-hour work weeks, occasionally 20-hour days, hard worker, persistent. And the article, of course, praised him for it. But at, uh, and then today, this is an important detail, he's worth $9.5 billion. I read that article and I thought, but then what? What will happen 20, 30, maybe 40 years from now? What will happen to his wealth? Well, his money will go to his kids and his body will go to the grave. If this man doesn't know Christ, then his earthly treasures won't last very long at all. Jesus says in Mark 9, 36, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. Earthly treasures don't last, but God's treasures do. Let's turn to Matthew 6. Turn to Matthew 6. Jesus teaches about the value of things in his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 19 says this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in, break in or, or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So to be clear, the application I'm making is that faithfully sharing the gospel is a good way to store up treasures in heaven. Be faithful as Christ's messenger and you will be rewarded for it. And I guarantee the rewards we, we receive from Christ will be far greater and worth every amount of suffering, rejection, or inconvenience that we face here on earth. So tonight, we've looked at our motive for scattering. We've seen that evangelism is God's means of salvation. Evangelism is a command and evangelism is an act of love. We've looked at our barriers for scattering. We've seen that Whenever we possess a fear of man and when we lack a fear of God, sharing the gospel to the glory of God is impossible. 
And three, we've looked at our message, how to start the conversation, how to present the gospel, how to close the conversation, how to use an acronym like GMCS or whatever, is, uh, whatever else is biblical or memorable, helpful to you. And finally, we looked at our reward for scattering. There is joy in seeing the sinner converted and there are crowns awaiting the faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Let me close by asking you some questions. When was the last time you shared the gospel? Have you shared the gospel in the last month? Have you shared the gospel in the last year? Have you ever shared the gospel? If you're a believer, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then the very best thing, the most important thing you've ever learned in your life is how to have your sins forgiven. It's how to go to heaven when you die. We can't keep that in. We can't keep that to ourselves. My prayer is that each one of us would grow in our faith, in our understanding, in our boldness, in our commitment as, fo as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Let's lead the way here in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is where God put us. So as our evangelism team likes to say, let's show Lincoln who loves them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful message of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a Roman cross and pay an awful penalty that we deserved. And he did that out of love. You demonstrated your love for us by sending your son to die for us. He didn't stay in the grave, he rose again. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful and clear in sharing the message of salvation with the lost. I pray that you'd help us to be effective, help us to be winsome, help us not to have a fear of man, but to have a fear of you. Help us to get out of the way so that your spirit can work. And Lord, above all, just make us faithful. Help us to be faithful stewards of this gospel you've entrusted us with. We, look, we thank you, Lord, for the many great examples that you've placed around us. We thank you for the beauty of your church where we find so much encouragement, where we find so many teachings and so many um, great examples of how to love you and, and share your word and, and live for you. I pray that we'd be faithful members of your church. I pray that um, we'd be faithful followers of, of your word until you call us home. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.